I'm a wilderness photographer. Let me introduce Joshua Cripps to the Nikon Theater stage. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you guys. I really appreciate that. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here kicking off the last day of CES with you. And thanks everybody who's tuning in. Hi, Mom. Uh, so, <laughs> can, I, can I start just by seeing a show of hands? Who out there is a photographer? Cool. Who out there loves landscape photography? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You guys rock. If you didn't raise your hand, that's okay. Nobody's perfect. No, I'm just kidding. I, I'm really happy to be here with you guys, and I'm hoping that even if you don't love landscapes quite as much as I do, that I can provide you a little bit of inspiration to get you out there shooting, building a connection with the natural world, which I think is one of the most fundamentally important parts of being a living, breathing being on this planet. So, like Mike said, my name is Josh Cripps, and I'm a wilderness landscape photographer from up the road here in Mammoth Lakes, California. And a lot of people want to know, what does that mean to be a wilderness landscape photographer? Well, basically it means that I like to go places that are just a little bit harder to get to, places that are a little bit off the beaten path. Basically, anywhere where there's no road, and you got to get there under your own power with your own two legs. And because of that, because the access to these places isn't necessarily easy, sometimes the photography isn't that easy either. So depending on where I'm going, what I'm doing, I might be carrying a backpack that weighs anywhere from 40 to 50 pounds over these high mountain passes, dozens of miles a day, dealing with mosquitoes and other annoying creatures like plague-ridden squirrels, and that's not a joke. Uh, it can be freezing cold even in the summertime. This was taken in May a couple of years ago after one of the coldest nights of my life in the high Sierra. And even if you're out there in July, you need a puffy and a beanie for those early mornings. You are dirty and sweaty and gross and disgusting for days at a time without access to a shower. And it can be utterly exhausting. You're up early, you're out late, you're hiking all day. Sometimes you just want to go home. A lot of times you don't get enough to eat. On this particular trip, I forgot the little packet that contained my dinners. So I ended up eating half a salami sandwich for lunch and half a salami sandwich for dinner, and I lost five pounds in three days. And when I got home, I ate an entire pizza. So it can be dangerous if you end up on terrain that you're not well equipped for. My friend and I chose this route without realizing we'd have to go over this couloir right here, which is, doesn't look like it from the photo. It's about 50 degrees, and it's totally iced over. We had no crampons, no ice axes. It was frightening, scary, and dangerous. And it can be lonely if you're out there for days at a time by yourself. The way I cope is I tend to talk to myself in a lot of different kinds of voices. So it sounds pretty miserable, right? Why do I love to do it then? Well, first let me say that I love all kinds of landscape photography, from wilderness to roadside landscape photography. I love to celebrate and share the beauty of planet Earth. In fact, all of these photos that I'm showing you right now are roadside locations. Even this one, which looks so wild, the car is just 50 feet behind me on a dirt road. But when it comes to photographing the wilderness, there's really something special about it. There's five things that I love about being a wilderness photographer, and I'm going to share those with you guys right now. So the first one is, there aren't any people there. I'm a nature photographer. I'm an introvert. I don't like being in big crowds. You guys are okay, though. So for example, this basin right here, my friend Joe and I backpacked up here in August on a weekend this past summer. And in three days, we saw five other people. That's it. And we're seeing things like this, like this, like this, and like this. And we literally have it just for the two of us. So if you are willing to put in a little bit of effort, walk just a quarter of a mile away from the car, you can find yourself in a location that 99% of people aren't going to get to. The second thing I love about the wilderness, there's a profound serenity to it. You get to these places where the only thing that's happening is the wind whistling through the trees, but the mountains, the lakes, the rocks, the streams, they just sit there day after day, year after year, century after century. It's this humbling display of geologic time. And if you go out there and you sit down on a rock, you tap into that geologic time. It gives you this amazing feeling of tranquility and serenity. And you start to wonder, boy, I've got such a short time on this planet. Why was I so concerned about getting that last TPS report finished before I left the office on Friday? Three, there is a staggering beauty 
to the wilderness. Now, we, we all know about the beauty of front country destinations like Yosemite Valley, right? This is El Capitan, or the Virgin River Canyon in Zion National Park, or going to the Sun Road in Glacier National Park. But the truth is that the wilderness holds just as many, if not more, of these kinds of scenic gems. So speaking of glacier, this is a place deep in the glacier wilderness called Glens Lake. It's about 13 miles in. And it is staggeringly beautiful and staggeringly dramatic, just as beautiful as anything you can see from a parking lot in Glacier. I mentioned Yosemite as well. This is the Yosemite wilderness deep in the northwestern corner of the park. The only people out there, me and my buddy Ryan, we had this scenery all to ourselves. But one of the most incredible things about this kind of scenic beauty in the wilderness is that it often exists outside of national park boundaries. This is a place called Temple Crag. It's one of the most dramatic rock formations on the planet. It's a 3,000 foot castle of stone. And it's not in a national park, it's just in the Inyo National Forest in California. This is the Sabrina Basin, same story. Stunningly beautiful and dramatic. It's not in a national park, it's just in the John Muir wilderness. And this is one of my favorite places, one of the most beautiful places on the planet. It's called Thousand Island Lake. It's not in any national park, but it's in the aptly named Ansel Adams Wilderness. So the fourth thing I love about the wilderness, when you combine this kind of scenery with the emotional response that you get from being in a place like this, with this kind of solitude, the potential you have for photography is limitless. And that leads to the fifth thing I love about the wilderness, which is sharing it with you guys. Because this the wilderness is something that I love deeply, something that I want to protect, but I can't do it by myself. I need your help. And so the best way I can do that is to help you build a relationship with these places. And the best way for me to do that is to show you pictures of these incredible locations. Like this place, it's called the Pioneer Basin. It's high in the Eastern Sierra Nevada in California. It's one of the most grandiose and breathtaking places I've ever been. It's a gigantic granite cirque. It's full of meadows and wildflowers, and it's ringed with these 13,000-foot peaks. And the name, the Pioneer Basin, is so appropriate. You get there, and it feels like you're in a place before the West was settled. Maybe even before humans were in California, it's this prehistoric denuded landscape. You know, and these rocks and these tarns, they have probably been there since the last ice age 10,000 years ago. So the last time I was there was July of 2014. And just curious, has anybody been to the Sierra Nevada in July? A couple of people. So you know we get these amazing monsoon thunderstorms, right? A lot of times what happens is they'll build up in the mornings, then it rains, it pours rain from 2 to 5 o'clock, then the clouds break up around sunset. And that's exactly what happened on my last trip there. So I'm heading up over the 12,000-foot Mono Pass. The clouds are starting to build up going down the backside, I can see the rain off in the distance over these fields of Indian paintbrush. And pretty soon it's just pouring rain on me, drenching me from head to toe. But I don't mind because I'm just running around this basin photographing the fields of lupins, the tarns, the rocks, having an absolute blast. Then, just like clockwork, getting on towards sunset, I notice the clouds starting to break up, and this golden light appearing in the sky to the west. So like any good photographer, I started roaming around the basin looking for a promising composition waiting for the sunset, waiting for that light to hit. And I was very lucky, I found this beautiful stream that curved off through the landscape to this lake in the distance with this incredible panorama of mountains in the background. And pretty soon the sun is going down, it drops into that crack that I saw, and it starts lighting up the mountain in these really, really cool, interesting ways. And I'm starting to get excited because I'm thinking, all right, the light's gonna really start blowing up now. And then you know what the sun did? It's just snuffed out, nothing happened. So. All right, that's annoying, but you know, my motto is you don't go home until the light is well and truly gone. So I sat there and I waited and the sun goes down further and further. Pretty soon it hits the horizon. And when it hits the horizon, what it starts doing is shining through all that beautiful smog we have in the Central Valley and sending off these beams of ruby light. And you can see how deep blue the clouds are in the sky, right? So we have this ruby light coming from the sun, hitting these, these deep blue clouds and creating this amazing purple atmosphere that diffused through the entire basin. And you better believe when this photo popped up on the back of my camera that I was doing my happy photo dance. You know? And then the sun actually did go down and the light got dark. So I went back to my camp and you know, fried up a chipmunk for dinner and went to bed. And without, you know, it seemed like I barely had time to roll over and all of a sudden, mm, 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 the alarm goes off. Oh. 
So I look at my watch and it's 5 a.m., which means it's time to get up for sunrise. And I'm so cozy and warm in this sleeping bag and it's freezing, literally freezing outside, all the grass is frozen. My shoes are soaked from walking around in the rain the day before. So the last thing I wanna do is get up and photograph, especially because in the Sierra in July, sunrise is notoriously clear and I love these big cloudy kinds of scenes. But I have no excuse, right? I'm there to photograph, so I better get up and do it. And I unzip the tent and I kind of, you know, turtle my head out there and look around and actually see some clouds up there above the mountains. And that's pretty cool. So I take my shoes and get my wet shoes on and I squish down to the lake next to where I'm camped. And it looks like this. And it's utterly placid and pristine and beautiful and there's some mist rising off the lake. But it's not anything that I personally would write home about, but that's totally okay because this is actually still about 10 minutes before the sunrise. And so I know when the sun comes up over here, these are the only clouds in the sky. I'm looking south, so the west, the north, the east is totally, totally clear. I know when the sun comes up, they're gonna hit these, cl hit these clouds and it's gonna blow up. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, that's exactly what starts to happen. And three minutes after this, this is what the scene looks like. And now I'm starting to get really excited because you can see the light bouncing around the amphitheater of the mountains there in the background. And I have a, I don't know about you guys, but I have a hamster who lives inside of my brain. And as soon as I wake up, he starts running on the treadmill and he's going, okay, this is cool, but I got to find something better because, you know, I love reflections, but they're a little bit of a crutch in landscape photography. I want to find something a little more sophisticated, a little more interesting. So I start sprinting back and forth around this lake, trying to find something, jumping over these streams. And eventually I find this perfect little half moon shape where the grass and the wildflowers are making this beautiful frame to highlight the reflection. And five minutes after I took this photo, this is what the scene looks like. And it's one of the most extraordinary, beautiful moments of my life. And I can't believe I'm there to witness it, let alone photograph it. And I'm overjoyed to be there. And what made the morning even better was that a lot of times when the sun comes up in the Sierra, the clouds will evaporate. But on this morning, they stuck around. And I got to take the next hour to roam around the entire basin photographing these beautiful things, this window into the sky, or this stream leading off to the mountain in the background that has just got its light just on that one mountain. Extraordinary morning. And pretty soon the sun goes up and it's harsh and it's time to pack it up and, and go home. So now if you're out there right now and you're saying to yourself, well, I like landscape photography and this is a beautiful place and that looks like a lot of fun and I like the sound of a fried chipmunk for dinner. You know, can I go to this place and can I take these kinds of photographs? And the answer is yes, you, you can and you absolutely should. But what does it take to get to a place like this? Well, the Pioneer Basin, it's not too bad. It takes about half a day to walk in there, right? That's not too bad, you can walk for half a day. Uh, but you have to bear in mind you need to go over a 12,000 foot mountain pass and you're probably carrying about 40 pounds on your, bag, uh, on your back and it's about 12 miles total to get in there. So there's a little bit of a barrier to entry. What about a place like this? Well, this one, me and my buddies hiked up there in July this past summer, and this actually took us, instead of a half day, it took us two half days, so that's one day, to walk in there. And on top of the distance, we also had the elevation gain. So the trailhead here is at 7,300 feet. The top of the mountain there is at 13,300 feet. So you're talking about 6,000 feet of elevation gain done with these two machines right here. Now, of course, we're not camping on top of the mountain, right? We're camping in the basin down below it. So the basin, you know, it's only 4,000 feet above the trailhead, so it's pretty easy to get to. Now, on top of the distance, on top of the elevation change, what we have, uh, is anybody from the West Coast? Did you guys experience the winter last year? Okay, so we had a monumentally enormous winter here in California last year, and what that meant for the Sierra was snow. In fact, everything above 10,000 feet, even in July, was covered with snow. The way that we had to get up to that basin was through this gully right here. You can see it's completely covered with snow. So for us, that meant we're traveling with crampons and ice axes, despite the fact that it's the middle of July. We're sweating like crazy. We're in shorts and t-shirts, but it's very slow going up over the snow. And in fact, when we got up to the lake itself, what we found was that it was completely frozen over. In fact, the ice is seven to eight feet thick on this lake. And we're looking at each other going, well, where are we supposed to camp? Where are we supposed to put our tents? Because these formations are called sun cups. They're anywhere from a foot to three feet deep. And you're thinking, if you put your tent across that, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna be curled up like a pretzel trying to sleep on this. So 
We walk along the side of the lake there for about 10 minutes, and we're li really lucky to find this beautiful sandbar, flat, soft. We put our tents down there, and along the way, we found some really cool stuff, like these pools of meltwater sitting on top of the ice. And these things are incredible because not only are they reflecting that beautiful azure blue of the Sierra sky, but they're also letting the white of the ice and the snow shine up through them. So they have turned this incredible tropical turquoise color, like something you'd see in the Whitsunday Islands in Australia, if anybody's ever been there. So I don't know if you can see my two friends right here. That's basically where we ended up camping. That is the outlet of the lake. So down there, the water, what's that? Royce Lake. So out down there, the lake is actually moving. The water's flowing down to the next lake. So the ice is broken up and it's created these open leads full of icebergs. And so not only do we have these meltwater pools, we have these reflections and these icebergs. And that hamster in my brain is now, he's running on his treadmill. Like there's smoke coming out of my ears because I'm going, these sun cups, these meltwater pools, these reflections, these icebergs, I've never seen something so extraordinarily beautiful. I cannot wait for sunset. You know, but sunset is still seven hours away. And so to kill a little time, we decided to go climb a couple of mountains. And then I came back and I'm scouting, waiting for that good light. And when I'm scouting for sunset, I'm not necessarily trying to take the prettiest possible picture. What I'm doing instead is I am looking for interesting features that allow me to point my camera in a lot of different directions so that if the light blows up to the south, I've got an option. If it blows up to the west, I've got an option. You know, I always like to be prepared. It's like the Boy Scout approach to landscape photography. So I'm really excited. I'm super happy because I'm finding all these things like these beautiful cracks and these beautiful pools and these wonderful reflections of all these mountains. But at the same time, I have to admit, I was a little bit dismayed because you can see how clear the sky is. And, you know, I'm looking at the ground going, th these features are utterly fascinating. And I'm a little bit worried that I'm not going to have something commensurately beautiful up in the sky to match them, right? Well, that's okay because as, uh, as Adam Woodworth will tell you, there, there he's at right there, if it's clear out, it means that you can take pictures of the Milky Way. So that's a pretty cool consolation prize. Anyway, I'm getting set up, I'm waiting for the sunset. You can see even as the sun is just about to go down, there's hardly any, any interest in the sky. But I always wait just to see what happened. And these clouds up here, what they did is they got on the phone and they called their cloud friends. And so pretty soon there's a couple of clouds showing up over here and then there's a group of clouds over here. And pretty soon it's a cloud party filling the entire sky. And what happens as the sun goes down, right, is the light, this is the sun, this is the light. As the sun goes down, the light goes up. So pretty soon the sun drops and it sends this beam of light up into the sky and it hits all the clouds and the scene looks like this. And I am floored because it's one of these utterly sensational moments that I get to experience as a photographer where you have the blue of the meltwater pool matching the blue of the sky and these amazing scallop shapes in the sun cup matching the scallop shapes in the, uh, in the sky. My heart is just pumping, my adrenaline is coursing through my body. I'm having an amazing time. You know, the amount of joy you can feel from experiencing a moment like that, let alone photographing it, is extraordinary. Pretty soon the light fades out. I calm down and I'm thinking, you know, I, I kind of still want to photograph the Milky Way. That, that sounds pretty fun. So I wander down to the outlet of the lake, and I find this beautiful pool. And I set up this composition looking off towards Miriam Peak. And I'm feeling really smug because I've looked at my app, and I know where the Milky Way is going to appear. And it's going to come up right here. And I'm thinking, I've got this nailed. This is such a cool composition. This is going to be a great shot. Well, you can see this dark cloud up here. It had other plants. So as it's getting darker and darker, that cloud is moving overhead. And so I'm, I'm shooting and I'm seeing a, a star appear over here and a star appear over there. But by the time it's actually dark enough for the Milky Way to come out, I can't see it. I can't see it with my eye and I can't see it in the camera because that cloud has just moved over the top of it. And at first I was really frustrated, like, come on, I want the freaking Milky Way. That's what I'm here for. Then I realized, you know what? This is actually a really beautiful moment with the clouds interacting with the sky and the sky interacting with the reflection in the water. And so I took a bunch of photos and they came out looking like this. Now that glow that you can see in the clouds is actually light pollution from California's Central Valley, which is 70 miles away. So if you think that human activity doesn't have an effect on the wilderness, think about the fact that I can see light from Fresno 70 miles away. So I take this photo pretty happy, go to bed. A couple hours later, I'm woken up. I hear this sound. 
And it took me a second to realize what it was. I thought maybe it was a mouse trying to get into my tent or something. No, it was raindrops, rain falling on my tent in the middle of the night. And well, it was footsteps too, actually, because one of the guys was sleeping out. And as soon as the rain starts falling, he boom, shoots over and uh, gets in the tent. Uh, but I love that sound. Uh, it's one of the most peaceful, wonderful sounds I've experienced in, in life. And so I fall back asleep like a baby. And maybe an hour later, again, uh, uh, time to get up. And it's still raining. Now, this is crazy. This is super weird because rain at sunrise in the Sierra, it's like a bizarro world. You know, and, and everybody has that little part of you that's like a curmudgeon, you know, and, uh, and so it's, I wake up and that curmudgeonly part is like, it's raining, just go back to bed. Like, you're tired, sleep. But then the other part of me, the photographer's like, no, this is really unusual. I flip the tent and I turtle my head out again and look around and I can actually see what's going on. Are the clouds, the rainstorm is moving off down this canyon to the north and we're just at the very tail end of it. And when I look up in the sky, past the rainstorm, what I see is texture. I see ribbons and striations and undulations and globe-shaped clouds and the little hamster is instantly on his wheel and he's like, you better get up right now. And I don't know if you guys can picture this, but being asleep in a sleeping bag to being fully clothed upright in a tent in half a second, doom, that's what, that was me. And so I shout at the other guys, you guys better get up because this is gonna be incredible. And sure enough, it's like somebody took one of those old Acme plungers and blew up the TNT and the sky exploded. And it looked like this. Now this is looking toward the sunrise. And this is nice, it's okay. I mean, there's every single color in the rainbow, which is cool if you're into that sort of thing. But what was really amazing about this morning was actually what was going on in the 270 degrees outside of this photo. So this is looking east toward the sunrise. When I turned my camera to the south, this is what I saw. You have these amazing fuchsias and salmon colors and alpenglow on Marion Peak complementing that amazing turquoise blue of the meltwater pools. And then I turned my camera to the west and this is what I saw. And now the sun is oozing down these mountains and it's tickling the bottom of these globular clouds and they're matching the shapes of the landscape. And then I turn my camera to the north, the northwest, and this is what I see. Now the sun's higher, right? And it is hitting these mountains with the force of a laser beam and it's just barely kissing the bottom of those clouds. And pretty soon that contrast between the light mountains and the dark clouds is so intense. It's like we're going into Mordor or something and the lake is breathlessly still and you can see 200 feet underneath the water. And again, my heart is just pulsing in my body and my adrenaline is pumping. The amount of joy and happiness and contentment I feel from experiencing this moment, let alone photographing it, is utterly overwhelming. But all good things come to an end. The sun keeps coming up. It just turns into another beautiful Sierra day. So we pack up. These guys had to get back to work. And we hiked back down the snow, the 4,000 feet, and the miles all the way back to the car. Now, I'm not telling you guys these particular two stories because I'm trying to make myself sound like I'm Mr. Wilderness dude because that's not me. I don't know if, if anybody saw Corey Rich's talk. Like, that guy is legendary. I'm so far below that. But I do like to hike. That's my thing, and I love going to these a little bit more places to see these kinds of things. But one of the incredible things about the wilderness is that it exists a lot closer to us than many people realize. And you don't have to do these kinds of hikes to experience it. This place, for example, it's called the Little Lakes Valley. It's in the eastern Sierra Nevada in California, not too far away. It's just as beautiful as any of the places I've mentioned today. And this is 20 minutes walk from the car. Or if you go another 15 minutes in, you can be standing in this place, and I guarantee you at sunset, the only company you're gonna have are mosquitoes. And you'll be able to experience all of those things I mentioned, the solitude, the serenity, the joy, the beauty of the photography, and being able to share that with the people that you love, and then only have to walk back 35 minutes to the car. Here's another incredible mountain basin in the Eastern Sierra, and you can be surrounded by these 13 and 14,000 foot peaks standing in fields of wildflowers, walk back to the car, be back to your hotel in time for dinner, and be totally immersed in the wilderness. Now, I've basically spent the whole day talking about mountains because that's my favorite thing to photograph, but the wilderness exists in tons of different kinds of environments all over the place. So has anybody out here been to Death Valley? It's only two hours from Vegas. It's really close, and it has one of the largest wildernesses within the United States. This place, for example, it's one of the most remote and pristine dune fields in Death Valley. It's less than a mile from the road, if you know which road to take. 
Has anybody out here spent any time in Utah? Utah is one of the most extraordinary environments that exists on our planet, and it's three hours from us. So if you have an hour to kill, you can spend that hour walking down an easy, beautiful path to this slot canyon. It's one of the most gorgeous, sensual, beautiful slot canyons I've ever been inside. If you have a half day and you don't mind getting your feet wet, you can experience scenery like this. And if you have a full day, you can walk out to this bluff in the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area and have an amazing, profound, beautiful wilderness experience and still be back to your car at the end of the day. So I could go on and on and on about the wonders and glory of photographing in the wilderness. You guys get the point, right? It's a special place and it's not as hard to get to as you might think, it has all these profound rewards for us as people, let alone as photographers. And I'd encourage you all, wherever you're at, to find the wilderness near you and to experience it. Now, I've got a couple of minutes left here. Uh, so I'd like to close just by talking about equipment. Everybody always wants to know, what do I bring on these kinds of trips? So I divide my equipment up into two groups of stuff. There's my trekking equipment and my camera equipment. So for trekking, I've been doing this a long time and I've made some realizations. You can be comfortable on the trail or you can be comfortable in camp, but you can't be both, which means if you bring a ton of stuff, you sleep well, you're warm, your shoulders, your hips are gonna be hating you as you're hiking. Or you can go light, have a lot of fun on the trail, go farther, and be a little cold at night. So what I do now is I carry an ultralight, I like to be comfortable on the trail, right? Because I'm going over these high passes, long distances. So ultralight backpack, an ultralight sleeping quilt, and an ultralight camping mattress. That's what I use to protect me from the elements. In terms of food preparation, uh, excuse me, uh, for, for the clothing, I bring two sets of clothing. Hiking clothes, dry, wicking stuff for the day, and then warm clothes for the nighttime. And guys, this is not five-star living. I bring one set of each. Doesn't matter how many days I'm out. Maybe if I'm out longer than three days, I'll bring a change of undies and socks, maybe. For food, I'll bring a, you know, you gotta bring a cook stove with gas and a plate and a spoon. By the end of your trip, your macaroni starts to taste like your oatmeal because you're eating everything out of that same bowl with the same spoon. Now, if, you're, if you ever go backpacking in the Sierra, you need to bring a bear canister, which protects, um, you might think it's protecting you from the bears, but really it's protecting the bears from us. Um, because if it become habituated to people, then the rangers have to go out and kill them. So you bring a bear canister and about two pounds of food per person per day. And then on top of that, I bring chocolate, which for me is important enough to have its own line item here on the menu. And finally, even though I spend a ton of time hiking, climbing, photographing out there, I always like to bring some kind of entertainment, whether that's a book, some music, or a movie on an iPad mini, something like that. For my camera equipment, I bring one body. Typically, for the past few years, that's either been a D810 or a D8, uh, excuse me, a D750. This summer, I'll be taking the D850 out for its test paces out there. And I bring three to four lenses, 14 to 24, 18 to 35, especially if I know I'm going to be doing a lot of long exposures, I bring the 18 to 35 because you can screw a filter onto the front. I bring a 50 millimeter for my mid-range and a 70 to 200 f4 for those intimate shots and any wildlife that I come across. I like to bring a couple of filters. I usually bring like 10 or 12 UV filters. Just kidding. I bring one circular polarizing filter and a 10-stop ND filter, both 77 millimeter screw-on, and I've modified all of these lenses to accept a 77 millimeter, except for the 14 to 24. I have a carbon fiber tripod. It only weighs about three and a half pounds, and it's a full-size tripod. I hate dealing with those little things, so I want the full size. A couple extra batteries, a couple extra memory cards, but you'd be surprised if you're judicious in your use, you don't use that much battery power, and you don't need that much space. So I just bring a couple of each. And then some kind of cleaning equipment, a blower or lens cloth, that kind of stuff. So I forgot to mention, depending on how far I'm going out and how cold it's going to be, my trekking gear generally weighs anywhere between 15 to 25 pounds, all told. And my camera equipment will weigh 10 to 15 pounds, depending on what I go. So if I do a quick overnight and it's fairly warm, my pack might be 22, 25 pounds. But if I'm going out for five or six days and I know it's going to be below freezing, I'm probably carrying more like 40 to 42, 43 pounds of equipment, 
which is not too bad if you guys want to get into it. Just start doing those pistol squats. That's what I do whenever I'm bored, just doing pistol squats. Just kidding. Anyway, thank you guys so much for your attention. Uh, you can find more of my work from the wilderness on my website, joshuacrips.com, or Instagram, Facebook, Joshua Cripps Photography. I'm literally running out of time here, uh, so I don't have any time for questions, but I'll be over here if you guys want to know about wilderness photography, how you can get started doing this kind of photography, any equipment questions, whether that's camera equipment or trekking equipment. Thanks, everybody watching online. Thank you guys who are here in person. Thank you, Nikon, for having me. I really, really appreciate the honor. Ladies and gentlemen, Joshua Cripps. An amazing program, a beautiful program. Right now, sit around, stick around. We've got at 1215 Christy Odom, the passion of wildlife.